Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Anne Laura Stoller, the author of Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power, Race and the Intimate in Colonial Rule. Welcome to Rip Rap, Anne. Thank you, Jim. I noticed that for an author whose book focuses so closely on intimate relationships, it was interesting how you acknowledged the impact and support of family and friends even dedicating it to your mother, sister, and a friend. This is a book that I, I would have dedicated to them, sort of no matter what the, the subject was. All of them had died within five years of one another. And all of them were sort of an inspiration in different sorts of way. Um, political inspiration, my dearest, oldest friend, Joanne. Um, sort of aesthetic, literary inspiration, my sister. and a sort of emotional intensity of my mother, but um, they would have been there in, in any case because they were so, so forceful and sort of present in my life while I was writing this. I thought it was interesting because it evoked that whole issue of intimacy and relationships and how people influence each other across that in, in those ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As we begin a more detailed discussion of this book, Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power, and its study of Dutch colonialism in the Javanese heartland of colonial Indonesia and in the Delhi of northern Sumatra. Perhaps you'd explain why you embarked on this project, how you formed your strategies for research, what archives did you find helpful, and why did you decide to use colonial photographs as a visual counterpoint to textual discourses and practices analyzed? Well, that question alone could take me hours to answer, um, but... Um, in a way, this is, this is a strange book because I didn't ever really mean to embark upon it. It was not something I said, I'm going to write a book now. Um, I had started, I should probably start back of where, where it, it emerged from and its genealogy. I had done my dissertation work in Sumatra and I was working on a labor history of multinationals. And I was just incredibly impressed with the extent to which issues around labor strategies, labor management, we're over and over again about the intimate. We're over and over again about controlling those people who worked on those estates who were Javanese, but those people who were also the, the European employers on them. Um, and it struck me sort of as a, a child of 68, a Vietnam War baby, a, someone who was honed on Marxism and feminism, that so much of what we did as scholars was study history from the bottom up. I mean, that was de rigueur. That was what you did. That was what you were supposed to do. And for my generation, we almost avoided looking at history from the top down. It was sort of not cool to be doing. It was not what you did. And it seemed very strange. There was some dissonance there. If we were so concerned with questions of power, of capitalism, of empire, of colonialism, why is it that we could only study those who are, um, who are being oppressed by it in some ways? And also assume that the only people being oppressed by it were those who were colonized. But the other sort of aspect of this, which was sort of very poignant for me, is how much anthropology at the moment that I was writing, imagine that the study of colonialism was only the study of the colonized that if you did an ethnography, what you did an ethnography of, was of only part of the people that were in that equation. And that led me not only to want to understand more of what, who these colonials were, but um, how the very categories themselves emerged. I mean, how do we know who was colonized or uncolonized? How did those very constructions themselves um, come about? As I said, I felt really constrained by the rubrics of what ethnography was supposed to be. And therefore, I got even more interested in what were the politics of the way ethnography was supposed to come out. Why is it that everyone who could have possibly been at those scenes of these intense labor relations, these forms of violence, that a large part of those people were siphoned out of the picture? Um, I guess another way to sort of speak about that genealogy is that there were really two kinds of, of statements that influenced me as a young scholar but continue to intrigue me now. 
and that I still don't know if I know how to answer or even that I'm always working in some sense to approach. And one of those, the most powerful, the one that sort of sustains me to this day, is the notion that, that and it is the most banal of all, is that the personal is political. I mean, it's such an easy sort of epigram of, of feminism of the 1970s. But to actually theorize what that could mean, what does it mean to say the personal is always political? How does that work out? What is it about the personal when we say it's political? Is, it, is that the personal is constructed by politics? Is that people's intimate lives are always political in some sense? I mean, how do you take that apart? The other one was, was coming from a really strong Marxist tradition that people make their own history, but not exactly as they please. Another kind of statement that, from my generation, we all know, we all sort of subscribe to. But to think what that actually meant. What, what are the spaces of agency that are possible? What are the ways in which people are constructed by the environments in which they live? And particularly with the kind of work I was doing in the archives by the categories in which they live. Um, I became fascinated, totally intrigued by categories, by why the colonial state was so concerned and obsessed with categories and why it was so obsessed with sex over and over again. Subjects that seem not to be the subjects that were the political returned not as my interest as a feminist or as a Marxist, but dead center in the archives themselves. So in a sense, the lead that I've taken over the last 15 years is not from theory, but it's from the archives themselves. It's really from the texture of those archives. And I sort of often say that sort of what interests me is, is working in some sense along the grain of the archive rather than in that way that Walter Benjamin has taught us we should always be working against the grain of the archive and coming up with that other story. Well, it's hard to come up with the other story unless you know what that dominant story is and how multiple it is 